Tuesday. Nothing personal word of the day for Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. Yes, the word of the day is yesterday's day because the expression that we would say all the time. Hey, it's just another Tuesday. What are you doing tonight? Oh, we got a game at 7.05. It's just another Tuesday. Hey, what happened? Oh, we've got players not getting along. We've got people not buying tickets. We've got another loss. It's just another Tuesday. You've heard me say that expression. I love it. And when things happen on a Tuesday, it's even more fun because you get to say, hey, it's just another Tuesday. Oh, crikeys. It is Tuesday. Yesterday was just another Tuesday for Danny Snyder. Now, you may think that we talk too much about the Washington Red Anders. You may think that how is it possible that there could be anything more interesting that could come out about the Washington Command Skins. You could be thinking that what happened yesterday, you've already covered it, haven't you? On Nothing Personal. And I would tell you, oh no. Yesterday was an all-timer. And I'm not prone to hyperbole. Why do I need to be? I get you 45 minutes every day. I don't need to practice in the art of hyperbole because every day something epic happens that we get to talk about. So yesterday, you know the investigation? Go back and listen to previous episodes. The oversight committee, the house convenes and we say, should they really be investigating the Washington Red Anders? Is there something going on in their front office, in their workplace? Is there this sexual harassment, taking pictures of skirts and women and nakedness and sexual discrimination and all the other stuff that Danny did that got him fined $10 million and made him run the team from some ghost-like place with the Bobby Valentine nose and mustache on? They investigated. They're saying that we can investigate because we are the United States government. You have elected us. We are elected officials. And we believe that if we make an example out of the Washington Anskins, then all other companies will realize, hey, we've got to behave. And that would be in the best national interest. Be in the interest of all workers to be, be protected. Okay, I'm in. But in the course of that investigation, about a week or two ago, we did a little segment because they found what could have been financial improprieties. <gasps> what does that mean? Is he going to jail? Is he going to have to sell? What? Two sets of books? Hmm. But then yesterday, the Oversight Committee wrote a letter to the FTC, Federal Trade Commission. Let's do a little primer. FTC, what do you think they do for a living? So you're up in the middle of the night. You're watching a bunch of infomercials instead of game theory. And you say, hey, that looks like a set of knives that I would like to buy. And then you put your credit card over the phone. You call the 1-800 number and someone miraculously answers in their skivvies, I can only imagine. It's a good thing they pick up. They know which line to pick up. I always thought about that. Is there someone only picking up the line to sell me Ginza knives? Or is that the same person who's picking up the line for 976-B-A-B-E? Who knows? Maybe Columbia Records. Same person. So I pictured them with a soundboard, like a switchboard. Oh, that's the Ginza Knives right now on channel 69 at 2.42 a.m. Hello, you have 10 minutes. You, you know, who. if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're not laughing. But if you do, you are laughing hard. Call this number in the next 6.9 minutes. Get $20 off this set of Ginza Knives. Hello, honey. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the knives. And then what happens? You don't get the damn knives. What do you do? Or you sign up to get Columbia Record discs and you get one a month and then your parents find out and they say, what's this $2.99 charge on my credit card coming every month? I don't know. I bought some music. Hmm. It, let's check it again next month. There it is again. Hmm. That's strange. How do we get rid of it? Yeah, I don't know. I think we can... They say you can call to cancel, but I can't find the number. Oh, we'll check the internet. Oh, there is no internet. All right, there's no way to cancel. Call a credit card company. Hey, we know right now from the first bedroom downstairs at 2.29 a.m., somebody gave the credit card number to this company, so there's nothing we can do about it. It was legit. And then you call the FTC and say, hey, that's deceptive. Those are deceptive trade practices. You're making it hard for the consumer to get their money or you're making it hard for the consumer because you're lying to them about what you're going to offer them. I always thought 
that Nutrisystem should ha be scolded by the FTC. Because everyone gets thin and then they get fat again. Do you think that weight loss companies want you to lose weight and keep the weight off? Come on. That's ridiculous. All of these companies want you to keep using their products. No one... What is, in, is it in the best interest of a company's earnings for you to actually get healed? Oh my God, I got a hangover. Let me take some Tylenol. Oh, now I got some aches, maybe some Advil. Man, this isn't getting better. Let me buy something like a Theragon and do that. Oh, then I got to get recovery boots. Oh, what about compression socks? You know, I mean, there's always going to be something to try to make you feel something you don't. That's what drugs are, right? At the end of the day, drugs get you to feel something different than what you're feeling. A level of ecstasy, no pun intended, unless you want to intend the pun, in which case, have fun, Molly. So the question is, is that unfair? Is it deceptive? Do people not know that all these products are just meant to keep you using their products? Maybe it's a coincidence that your iPhone 4 doesn't charge anymore. No doubt. Maybe Apple had nothing to do with it. So anyway... Congress sends a letter to the FTC and says, listen here, folks, we're going to need you to do a full investigation of the Washington commanders. And the reason is that we have reason to believe through documents that we have found during the course of our very legal investigation that Danny Snyder did not properly report revenue to the National Football League. Well, we may have heard that before, but what did he exactly do? What are they alleging? And they're going to have to check it. What they are saying happened is that there would be a Redskins game. Let's say the Redskins were playing the Giants. And let's say you bought a ticket for $50. That $50 goes into a pool. 40% of that $50, yes, that's $20, would go to visiting teams collectively, the other 31. But... If you say that that $50 ticket was actually to the Army-Navy game played at FedEx Field or to go see Johnny Cash play, it wasn't Johnny Cash. Come on, Coca, I'm blanking. Kenny Chesney, maybe. It was in the letter. It's some country music star. I don't know who. Never seen him. I wish I had seen Johnny Cash, though. As it stands, I have to settle with Joaquin Phoenix. So you say that $50 was Kenny Chesney. The NFL doesn't get any of that. We, as the Washington Enders, get to keep all of that $50. Now, that may seem okay, right? Because the person who paid the $50 got what they were paying for, so there's nothing deceptively unfair about that. But yet, it was Kenny Chesney? Okay. And yet, and it was a Navy game. I was pretty close. Oh, Navy-Notre Dame, whatever. I said Army-Navy. What's the difference? It's a college football game where you got what you paid for in theory. I mean, if your team stinks, you could argue I'm not getting what I'm paying for. But as you know, when you buy a ticket to anything, you are not guaranteed that an artist will play a song or that a team will win a game or that a team will play the player you want to see. You're not guaranteed any of it. R-T-B-O-T. -T. Read the back of the ticket, baby. So... The NFL takes a look at this and says, you know, we, we audit. We take a look at all of their football revenue. Is there really a chance that we miss this? Because the auditors for the team, right? They're auditing FedEx Field. They're auditing the revenue for the organization at the top level that owns FedEx Field, that gets the revenue from FedEx Field. If there's revenue that's misclassified, that is not for the auditors to find. That's actually promised by the CFO and the team president. Hey, all revenues are in the bucket they're supposed to be in. I am signing my name. I told you you have to do that. And I told you the faith that I had to have in our CFO. Thank you, Michelle, because c'est bien ça, non? because I knew that he would never make a mistake in misclassifying revenue, but I'm literally not down in the counting room making sure that every ticket and the revenue for that ticket is put in the right game, in the right place. You have to count on people to do it. But if there is a purposeful job of changing that, that comes from above. Mistakes happen, and you may sign your name to a mistake, and you have to take whatever responsibility is by making that mistake or having that mistake made under your watch. But if there is a systematic and long-standing pressure to reclassify revenues, that comes from the top. But then Congress said there's one other thing that you may be interested in FTC because we think it's unlawful and we think it may be even criminal. They are making it, the Washington Red Anders, impossible for people 
to get refunds. Now, why would that be an interest to the FTC? So picture that you give money to a team because you want to buy playoff tickets for that particular year and you get an invoice for playoff tickets. And then we say in the invoice, refunds are available if team does not make the playoffs. Now, we wouldn't say that, but let's just say you do. Then you don't make the playoffs. Then you have to allow for refunds. You cannot make it so it's a 14-step process. You can't make it that you have to solve a survivor puzzle, then Rubik's Cube, then stand on your hands while reciting the alphabet backwards, and then you get a refund. The FTC protects consumers against that. And so what's being alleged is that the Red Anders said, we are not going to give you refunds unless you do A, B, C all the way through Q. And then people just either gave up, didn't understand the process, and therefore they didn't get their refunds. When you don't give refunds to paying customers, guess what? You keep that money and you get to use that money for other expenses. It helps with your cash flow. It's the oldest trick in the book, which is give me money now and don't let me give you anything until later. I'm gonna use the money you give me now. It's like a Ponzi scheme, actually. I'm gonna take the money now, I'm gonna pay my payroll, my overhead, and then by the time I've gotta to deliver to you something, I'll worry about that then. So it's just kicking the expense down the can while keeping the revenue. And the reason I say that, obviously, is if you are paying in advance for a game in six months, but I use the money now to pay a salary, well, there's still a salary to be paid six months from now, which I'm in theory supposed to use the revenue from the game in which they're playing and the game in which is being played, but that ticket revenue is already used. So now I don't have any money. So I got to figure out how to get the next person to pay for it. I never really thought of it that way. So it really is like a total scam. So how is this going to end? It's not illegal, by the way. So the U.S. House Oversight Committee gives this over to the FTC. The FTC will do an investigation. So they, basically, they kick the can down the road to the FTC. It'll be interesting to know what comes next, whether or not the FTC will decide to investigate, whether there's someone in the FTC who actually gives a tinker's damn about Danny Snyder or the fans of the Washington Command Skins. We're going to find out. But the far more important story for Danny and Tanya Harding is whether or not the NFL owners are going to say Gnug. We want to see your books. We want to understand what you did. Because if you want to screw your fans, we're fine. That's your problem. But if you want to screw us, you're going to need a lot more than just jelly. So we'll see what happens with big old Danny. But it's just another Tuesday. God, what a nightmare. But he didn't have the worst day of any team president or team owner. Play me some music, Coca. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson? God, you guys are so pissed in uh, in Cincinnati, aren't you? I got a flood of So You Want to Talk to Samson's, which is when you get on my Twitter at David P. Samson and you ask a question, and sometimes it'll make the show. I'll try to get to it on my phone or whatever I do because that's what I do. I put my reading glasses on if you're on YouTube watching this. Nothing personal with David Samson. Go to YouTube. I got the Twillery Blazer going today. So I put on the reading glasses, the 150s. And I'm looking to see what people are saying. And all of a sudden, beep, beep, shh, beep, rotate, vibrate. Another person, blue, blue, blue. Blue is when you have an open direct message. Blue, blue. I said, uh-oh. Hey, David, I'm from Cincinnati. Does anyone not think of Lonnie Anderson when you think of Cincinnati? And you're talking to a guy who spent 15 years with Tony Perez. Please tell me the commissioner will hear what Castellini said and that he will do something about it, like make him sell. I hear you. I'm so sorry that you have to ask that question. Here's the background. There's an owner of the Reds, and his name is Robert Castellini. He's something else. He's got a son who works for him. His name is Phil Castellini. His son runs the team. Yes, I was not the only son to run a team of a father, stepfather, etc., who owned the team. There's a plethora of them. Some are better than others. Some have rings, some don't. Some get fired, some don't. Some actually run the team, some don't. So Phil Castellini and Bob Castellini 
are owners of the Reds. They took over for a guy named Carl Lindner, who is a very interesting old man when I first got in the game. I believe he took over for the Nazi Marge Schott. Marge Schott is an owner who got actually forced to sell because she was the biggest racist Nazi. You'd walk into her office like there's swastikas. Like it's unbelievable that she was able to last as long as she did. An absolute horror show, Marge Schott. Just there's nothing redeeming about her. Don't speak ill of the dead, David. Why not? When someone is worthy of ill speaking and it's not third degree, it's not hearsay, you have actually know this to be true, then it's okay. So the Castellinis credit don't credit. They've had some good years with Joey Votto, signed Joey Votto, then some bad years. They're, they are tanking this year. Not really tanking. They traded their players. They've got some really good young players. Their, their pitcher, Hunter Green, is really, really good. They had the rookie of the year last year in Jonathan, uh, India. I was about to say Jonathan, Indiana, which would have been strange because that's not his name. But I'm very bad with names. So it's not like they're an absolute disaster as an organization. But there are certain rumors within the game about the way Castellini is. And he's like many of the other owners, very meddling, sort of very confusing. I want this. No, I want that. Oh, that's not working. Let's change it and do this. Changing the plans all the time. His son does his job fine. Neither, neither lauded nor praised nor hated nor nothing. Just fine. Neutral. So Phil Castellini gives an interview. And in the interview, he's on a show. I'm, I'm sure if he's on social media, I'm not sure what he is. But he's on a show, and he's asked about, hey, what do you have to say to fans who are upset with where the team is? Who are very anxious and angry at trading the players. Now, keep in mind, this is the same Cincinnati team that signed Moustakas and Castellanos only one or two years ago and matched him with Votto and had Luis Castillo in that great trade with the Marlins. And they were looked at, wow, these guys are going to be good, but they couldn't quite get over the hump. They did not have the revenue to support it. And then they traded players. Wait a minute, who would ever do that? When you put a good team together and they don't win and you don't have the money to keep them together to run it back again so you don't run it back again. My, that's good business. That makes perfect sense. But when asked about it, what his answer was, where are you going to go? He's saying to the fans, let's start there. Sell the team to who? That's the other thing. If you want this debate, if you want to look at what you would do with this team to make it more profitable, make more money, compete more in the current economic system that exists. If you want to do that, you'd have to pick this team up and move it out of Cincinnati. So be careful what you wish for, fans. Uh-oh. Rule number one. When you are a middle-aged white guy and you are running the team and you report to a family member who is your, the owner of the team and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sidetrack you and tell you that has nothing to do with nepotism or sons or daughters or fathers or mothers when you are anyone, let's start with anyone who has a platform. Let's say you've got one listener to your podcast. You're one of the 3 million podcasts who started and you've got a thousand downloads in a year or a week or a month. Who cares? Whatever. Or you've got a million downloads a day. The platform, we've talked about it all through COVID. I think we've learned today, no matter how old you are, no matter what color you are, when you have a platform, there's a few things that you just don't want to talk about. You don't want to be perceived as being and I, you understand perceived is a word purposely chosen here, racist, misogynistic, in any way hitting the third rail that can get you canceled. You just don't want to do it. There are scores of examples where people with a microphone have gotten themselves in trouble on those topics. And the reason they have is they grew up in a time, much like I did, where the one thing you didn't do when you got your handbook of how to run a team, the number one rule was don't disparage your fans. When you win, thank your fans first. When you lose, thank the other team and thank the fans. When you go into the community, you say we're doing this for you, the fans. Everything is about them. I told you that no owners believe that. No owners actually think that way, but it's right in the handbook, right there. It's the number one thing to say. That's sort of been moved down now. It's sort of tertiary because now at top of mind has to be the way you treat employees, the way you treat women, keeping your hands to yourself, 
keeping your thoughts on race to yourself to the extent you have those thoughts that you shouldn't have, thoughts on trans, all these other things that really were not top of mind have now become top of mind, which is really good. So Phil Castellini saying to the fans, basically baiting them, he's saying, you know, I'm just, I'm telling him, I'm a truth teller. I'm telling him like it is. Well, I'm nothing personal I could do that because I don't run a team anymore. But as president of a team, I'm not doing that. Now, there are examples where I would have given speeches or talks where I'm going to say things like, the fans should appreciate the team more than they do. I hope the fans come out and enjoy this team more than they do. I want to explain to the fans why we're making the moves we're making. Take my word for it. We have more information than you have, as an example. But you do it, you try to do it in a tone. You try to do it in a manner that doesn't come off too condescending. And I definitely had problems with that because it's not that I always thought that I was smarter than everyone else. I just knew that I had more information than anyone else. So I was aware of what moves needed to be happened before they were being spoken about publicly. They were, they were planned. So I had to explain to people, and I did, was not always good at this, but I had to explain to people, hey, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. I understand how you feel. However, I can't afford to feel that way. Because people would say, David, how could you make these trades? How could you make these moves? Don't you feel badly for everybody? And I would have to cross my fingers and toes and say, yeah, I feel terribly. By the way, we won the World Series three years ago or six years ago or nine years ago. People in Cincinnati wouldn't be saying a word if they had won a World Series. I think they, but they, the fact is since 96, they've been in the playoffs like four times, which is not terrible at all. That's in 26 seasons. They've been in the playoffs four times for a small market team. It's not terrible. So Phil Castellini makes this statement. He's not aware that it's a Twitter absolute storm. So then he agrees to give an interview on his local broadcast before a game, for the Reds game, for the home opener, and he doubles down. What the hell are the PR people for the Reds doing? I understand if Bob Castellini is out to lunch and doesn't understand what his son said or doesn't care, or doesn't want to focus on it because he's out there doing other stuff. I'm good. But if you've got a consigliere, or you've got someone in PR, and they are looking at Twitter, which is their job, they better be, and they see what Phil said, you call Phil up right now and say, Phil, this is going to be a problem. Here's what we're going to say next. We're going to get you on the broadcast, and you are going to say, that was totally taken out of context. I couldn't have been more wrong to say it the way I said it. Obviously, we don't want to do anything to lose fans or to upset fans. We want to build on the team that we have, the young players. We want you to have faith in our ability to put a winning team together because that's what we want and that's what we care about. And to the extent that you thought that I was saying anything different, I am sorry. All right, great. He takes the microphone and he says, yeah, I said that. Where are they gonna go? He doubled down. So I see that happen and I say, all right, I'm firing someone in PR. I'm alerting the owner because whatever lunch he's out to is now he's got to come back. It's time to come back, come home, because now we need a statement. I would have been working on a statement for minute one. I tweeted that immediately, like work on a statement. But then after doubling down, I'm thinking, does he not realize he's got to release a statement? And he did. It took almost 10 hours. I apologize to Reds fans and regret the comments that I made earlier today. We love this city. We love this team. We love our fans. Wrong order. Holy crikeys. I understand how our fans feel, and I am sorry. Okay. It took 10 hours. It was short, sweet, but backwards. You start with, we love our fans. We love this city. We love this team. Fans first, always, in the apology. How many times do we have to teach the PR people? Are you not getting that in your classes, in your school, in your training? Fans first when you're apologizing. Fans first when you're acknowledging. Just remember, F squared. It's simple. So that's a pretty short, sweet statement, right? I'm sorry. It's all right, Phil. We totally forgive you. So... Your question is, what's the commissioner's involvement? None. 
The commissioner doesn't call Bob Castellini, doesn't call Phil Castellini. He has someone below him call and say, are you dealing with this? Because I'm too busy giving out Bose headsets. We're trying to make good with the players. We're trying to get fans back in the stadium. It's not like you're drawing so many people there, Bobby boy. So why don't you go out and do something? So Rob has his people around him. They alert him to what's happening because Rob wouldn't see it. He has to be told it by his PR people, which is why you have PR people. He then has someone go call Cincinnati and says to himself under his breath, God, I wish he'd sell the team already. But there are too many teams for sale. If Castellini sells the team, you've got the Nationals that could be for sale. Hmm, you've got the Angels. They're never going to sell. The Cardinals are rumored to be selling. The Marlins are rumored to be selling. You don't want that many teams for sale at once. That's going to have a quashing impact on price. You'd rather have fewer teams for sale. You have to make you have to make it as though, hey, you want to get in the game and you're a billionaire? You got one shot, and it's here in WKRP land. So the commissioner's not going to make him sell. Not going to do anything. Sorry. All right. <sighs> what do you want me to do, Coca? You're asking me about, I mean, I could talk about that. He's asking me about expansion. This is live right now. He's asking me how would anybody selling impact expansion? And the answer is expansion is not related to who owns the teams. There will not be expansion until the Rays and the A's stadium situation is taken care of. And we're going to actually talk about that maybe in this show, maybe in tomorrow's show. We have to get to it because there's so much going on with, with in Oakland and with these new ballparks. But the Rays and the A's have got to get their situation taken care of because if you use a possible expansion city as a threat for relocation or you actually have to relocate to one of those possible expansion cities, then you are making the 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 globe smaller, meaning you're making the options fewer in terms of expansion. And if you are trying to get the largest expansion fee along with the most money for the stadium in a public-private partnership, then you've got to have as few possibilities as possible, as few cities as possible eliminated. Okay, we're going to come back. I got to review this movie with J-Lo because J-Lo and Ben are engaged, and I just was thinking about it during this movie. It's called Marry Me. And then I've got two corrections and some anger regarding the pick of the day. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. How are you? Thank you for rating, reviewing, for following, for telling your friends about Nothing Personal. We might as well keep going. Every day, 45 minutes. There's so much to talk about. We cut so many things. Coca, someone uh, tweeted at me, and it's not the first one, saying, why don't you guys go an hour and a half a day? Because you're always cutting stuff out of the show. You have at least an hour and a half you can do. And I said, hmm, wait to see. Okay, I watched Marry Me. Has anybody seen that with J-Lo? She sings. So here's the story. She's going to marry some guy, some famous singer, and then finds out the famous singer's cheating on her. So she says, we're breaking up off the wedding. But she's given a concert. She looks in the audience and she sees Owen Wilson, who's the single father of a child, and says, hey, do you want to marry me? And he says, huh? It's sort of like the proposal, except Owen Wilson doesn't work for Sandra Bullock. It is so tacky and unimaginably corny and ridiculous. But what do you think happens in the movie? Spoiler alert. Owen Wilson meets Jennifer Lopez, who's this huge star, and he's just a normal teacher. And it's a mutually convenient relationship. She gets to tell the media and the paparazzi that she's over her ex-fiance and she's moved on with Mr. Normal. It's time for her to be normal. Mr. Normal gets to bring the superstar to his classroom and show off to his kids and his daughter. And then they go their separate ways. Two days in a row of Marilyn Martin and Phil Collins. That's funny. I don't remember what it was yesterday, but we mentioned it yesterday. I'm almost positive. And then they go their separate ways. But then late at night, they'll call because the star is lonely. She has no one to talk to. And then Owen Wilson will take the call and say, wow, I can't believe she's calling me. And then all of a sudden, they'll look in each other's eyes and then they kiss. Yeah. Okay. Marry me. It's got good music, though. 
but it's just such an old, boring topic. What happened to Jennifer Lopez doing movies like Out of Sight? Even The Wedding Planner. What about the one with Ray Fiennes as the mayor or the senator? What was that one called? When uh, when she was she was the housekeeper. By the way, it's the same concept. Made. Made in Manhattan. Thank you, Coca. That's pretty good. It's the same movie except opposite. Anyway, I would take a hard pass. All right, a couple things from yesterday. When we do a show, we make mistakes and we own them. It's sort of like our wait to see. When we get a wait to see right, we'll revisit it. And when we get a wait to see wrong, we'll revisit it. Well, sometimes we make mistakes. Totally fine. I told you yesterday that you had three days to get your taxes in. I knew that Friday was the Seder. It's Passover. Get ready for matzah and prunes. Yeah. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you don't know what I'm talking about. I also sort of realized it was Good Friday. I didn't realize because I don't do my own taxes. I have an accountant and I must admit, I didn't realize. April 15th is actually not the filing day because you don't have a filing deadline on a holiday, which is Good Friday. And you don't have it on a weekend, which would have been Saturday. So they moved it to Monday. So you've got till April 18th to do your taxes, Coca. That's one correction, thank you. Second correction, clarification. Last night we had the play-in tournament and I'm watching the game and I'm hearing from, from people on Twitter, David P. Sampson, about play-in. And my question was, where are these stats? Do these count as regular season stats? Are these playoff stats? Do you get to market that you're a playoff team if you lose in the play-in game? Like the loser of tonight's Hawks-Hornets game, they're not in the playoffs, but they were in the play-in tournament Does that, do they get to say it's like being in the playoffs in 2020 when you're the Marlins or the Reds, you were in it. COVID shortened season, expanded playoffs, but damn right, you were a playoff team. You get to break the streak. Apparently what I've been told is that people will market that they made the playoffs, but the stats do not, are not considered playoff stats. So when you look at your career playoff stats, What Kyrie Irving did last night, which was spectacular when he made his first 11 shots or his first 12 shots, which would have been a playoff record. That is not a playoff record because it's like it didn't happen. It's not a regular season record because it's like it did not happen. It doesn't count toward your coaching career and wins or losses. Doesn't count in your points per game, rebounds per game, assists per game, triple doubles, nothing. It's like it didn't happen. So now they're going to have to set a whole new set of records for play-in games. And I find that all to be bizarre. I think you should make it part of the regular season. Do something. Make it part of the playoffs. You have to count this. It's not fair to have players doing something, which could be spectacular. What if someone scored 100 points in a play-in game? Will Chamberlain still would have the record alone? Come on. That is totally ridiculous. So you're, you're right, Coke. You don't have to yell it, but you're totally right. The reason why you're not considered to be a playoff team, if like if the loser of the Hawks-Hornets game tonight, is that if you lose the game, you're not in the playoffs and you're in the lottery. So therefore, you can't say you're in the playoffs because you're in the lottery. I understand the concept. I'm just saying you have to count them as something. You just have to. So I'm watching the play and I'm watching the Nets. We're given eight and a half, and we're feeling great. They're up 22. They're crushing. I, Irving can't miss. The Cavs are fine, but they're, they're, they're outmatched. And then the Nets did what the Nets do. They won by seven. We lost. That bothered me. Not as much as me picking the Phillies to beat the Mets. Zach Wheeler was a Cy Young. Some people thought he should have won the Cy Young last year. Had an amazing season. The Phillies put together a great offense this year. It's the first week of the season, so it's hard to tell because you won't remember. Do you remember the first week of last season? If you go back, I have some recollection that the Baltimore Orioles had some share of first place after the first week of the season where they won the first three games against the Red Sox or the Yankees or something. And everyone's saying, wow, the Orioles may not lose 100 games. This could be the biggest upset ever. The baseball season is so long that you cannot judge anything about your team. If you're one and four like the Marlins, don't be upset. You could still win 81 games. If you're four and one, like or four and two like the Mets, don't get upset. You could still lose 90 games or win 90 games. It's so early. 
But the Phillies and Wheeler just, they look like crap right now. And the Mets were able to win the game. That's a double loss. We are 42 and 36. We're only six games over. Okay, we're going to keep going. We've got another non-playoff game. But this one, it's a winner go home. Because the loser of the Hawks-Hornets game literally is done for the year. The winner of the Hawks-Hornets game gets to play the Cavs on Friday to decide who gets to play the Heat. So with this team, either the Hawks or Hornets, because they're the ninth and 10th seed, the way it works in the play-in tournament, you got to win twice. You got to beat nine or 10, and then you got to beat the loser of seven, eight. The loser are the Cavaliers, so they get to go home and play the winner of the Hawks Hornets. Hawks favored by five. Here's what's going to happen, and I've got to wait to see for you. The Hawks are about to win two in a row. Trey Young will be in the playoffs. They're giving five to the Hornets, who actually are a tough team. But I'm going to say Hawks minus five over Hornets, and then wait to see. Bonus wait to see. I think it's a bonus. I can't remember if we have a wait to see later in the show. But a bonus, or an actual, the only wait to see is that Trey Young and the Hawks will be in the playoffs. Okay. Oh, I got one more pick. So I've been watching the Brewers. My team, I love the Milwaukee Brewers. They're supposed to have the best pitching. Their pitching has been absolutely horrific. Their offense is supposed to be good, too. Their bullpen is supposed to be great. Yelich has finally been hitting, but I don't know where his power, where has all the power gone? I know Yelich never did steroids. He was not that guy at all. He was always a guy who hit for average and for power, which is why he's Christian Yelich. But he's had a couple of seasons that are well below his potential or what he's proven to be, and he's hitting the ball this year. I don't know that he's got, that he's showing power and may only have one home run, but the Brewers are a really good team. They're just not showing it. Tonight, Corbin Burns is pitching. Favored to win the Cy Young, should win the Cy Young. I think he's going to win the Cy Young back-to-back. He's going against the Orioles. The Orioles. What's important about this game is that the Brewers are going to win it because Corbin Burns is going to have a way better start than his opening day start, which was an absolute uh, not reflective of the talent he is. And as pitchers, you know, the funny part is this is his second start. Five days from now will be his third start. That's almost 10% of his season done just like that, right? You only get 30 starts. Let's say you get 33 if you'd never miss a start and you're the number one starter. But we always look at pitchers in three three game increments, three start increments. So if you have three starts in a row, you don't dismiss that. Like, oh, it's early, we'll be fine. It's sort of like with at-bats. After 30 at-bats, it's no big deal because an everyday player is going to get 600 at-bats. That's only 5%. So that's like the equivalent of one bad start. Not a big deal. But Corbin Birds needs a good one, and he's going to get it. Brewers over the Orioles. Hawks over the Hornets. How about this one? Did you like this, this statement? This got so much attention. I effing hate this place. How many times have you said that, right, when you're at work? or when you're doing something, or you're driving, and someone beeps at you, or or you're beeping at someone, and you just sort of say, I effing, I don't want Coca to have to bleep, so I I don't want to say that, so just say, oh, (laughs) sorry, that's funny, cut, obviously, he'll cut that out, okay, 4, 12, 69, I don't want people to have to bleep it or not hear it, but you just say, I effing this place, I effing hate this place, there was a player for the Philadelphia Phillies who did just that, he made three errors, That's not easy to do. Do you remember when Dan Ugla made three errors in an all-star game? The year was, come on, Coca, 2000 and, I don't know, 15? And it was at City Field, and Dan Ugla, I believe, made three errors in an all-star game, which I believe is still a record to this day. And he made the errors, and he came back to the team, and we were laughing about it. He was embarrassed about it. But he took it in stride. He was a veteran who had a good sense of humor and still does. Well, Alex Bohm with the Phillies does not like getting booed, does not like making errors. It was 2008. My God, was I off by a lot. Was it in City Field or that? That then would be Shea Stadium? No, I think it was still City Field. Either way, ugly. My God, that was 14 years ago. So. The Phillies, he makes a bunch of errors in the first three innings. He gets booed. He walks off the field. He says, I effing hate this place. There's cameras on you. To all athletes out there and all presidents and GMs, anybody in the public, there are cameras on you at all times. Just be aware 
Oh, is it Yankee Stadium? I got the whole memory wrong. Did he even make any errors at all? I may have it wrong. Thought he, oh, he did make three. All right, so he's in New York. Check. Three errors? Yes. Wrong year, wrong stadium. Great. Can I move on with the rest of this now? Are we done with Coca? I mean, are we done with uh, Ugla? So Alex Bohm gets caught because there are microphones, there are cameras watching him leave the field. There are people on Twitter, their entire job is to read your lips. But by the way, we put microphones all over the field so people at home hear the, they hear the pop of the glove, the ball hitting the glove or the crack of the bat, right? We want you to get the sights and sounds of the game to feel like you're a part of it. And every once in a while, the announcers have to say, hey, I'm sorry, but that's part of what happens. Sometimes you hear foul language. It's only fair. So Alex Bohm gets off the field and he realizes that he's got a serious problem because he's all over the internet. So what do I do? I'd go right down to the clubhouse and say, hey, let's just make sure that we take care of this because this is going to be a story. And you're a Philly, and we know how difficult it is to be a Philly fan. We know how difficult it is to be a Philly player. Philly fans are tough. They're on you. But you can never say, I effing hate this place because they're not going to love you ever again. So he immediately, he didn't do a Phil Castellini. He immediately said, emotions got the best of me. I did not mean any offense toward the franchise or Philadelphia. Now, do I believe him? No chance, toilet pants. Do I think he can't stand being booed? Yes, I do. There are players who are incredibly sensitive about that. There are players in my career who would come off the field, come into the clubhouse, and they would know that someone in section 104 in the fifth row was heckling them. There are other players who come in and say, I don't hear anything. I am so locked in, zoned in. I don't hear boos. I don't hear cheers. It is completely oblivious. I believe 30% of the people who say that. I believe 100% of the players who tell me they know that they can hear what is happening in section 111. The reason I don't believe Alex Bohm is that it takes a very certain type of player to be okay with being booed at home. Aaron Judge, for example, is being booed at home right now. Whenever he does something wrong, the people at Yankee Stadium, and Yankee fans are not Philadelphia, not even close, way better. But they're booing Aaron Judge because Aaron Judge did the unthinkable. He said, I may leave you. No one leaves the Yankees. People come to the Yankees. Aaron Judge did not take the $200 million contract. And then if he doesn't get a home run or a double, and by the way, he's having a good start to the season, and so are the Yankees, having won their game over the Blue Jays last night. Actually shut him out. But Aaron Judge is getting booed. And if you know Aaron Judge, the answer to that is, it's, 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 like, wipe, it's like wipe the fly off. He's good. He's not sensitive to it all. He's totally fine with it. He's not going to either choose to be a Yankee or not be a Yankee because he's getting booed. He's not going to really let that impact his decision in any way. Alex Bohm, on the other hand, may be the opposite. He may be someone who won't be able to let this go. He may be someone who this will impact him going forward, impact his ability to perform in Philadelphia. We've got to wait and see. He actually said, I said it. Do I mean it? No. It's a frustrating night for me, obviously. I made a few mistakes on the field. Look, these people, these fans, they just want to win. You heard it. We come back, they're great. I'm just sorry to them. I don't mean that. Guess what the Philly fans did? God bless them. When Alex Bohm took the field the next game, a standing ovation. Do you think Alex then said, hey, they love me now. It's all good. The reason I'm laughing is that one of the great rules, and it's not a top three rule for most people, but it's always been my rule, is that in order to be in public, you cannot believe the good that is being written about you if you're not willing to believe the bad that is being written about you. I never believed the bad that was written about me, so therefore, I never believed the good. Now, you're going to say, Samson, there was no good. Well, that's not true. And that's the same now with nothing personal. There are people on Twitter say, oh, God, it's the worst show. How could you let this son of a owner who has no right to say about anything, never done anything in his life, get a show? Blah, blah, blah. I've got a show. But there's a lot of you who say, hey, it's, I love it. I listen every day. It's one of my favorite shows. I just let it all roll. 
players need to do the same thing. You cannot just live for the cheers. You cannot live for the love without understanding how to deal with the hate. I'm proud of Alex for coming forward as quickly as he did. It is critically important. There are players all over who have to live with the reality that they're only going to be popular when they're doing well. That's how it is. What have you done for me lately? You can win MVPs. You can win World Series. You can be the best player on the planet. The minute you slump, the minute you miss a shot, fans feel they buy tickets. They have a right to boo because it makes them feel better. It's like a release for them. It's totally normal and fine. Let it go, Idina. That's our show. We did not get to the public financing, Coke. I really do want to get to that because there's so much going on. So let's see if we can do that tomorrow, okay? All right, that's our show today. Remember, it's just business. This is nothing personal.